Welcome church family, I'm Shavar, I'm the Youth and Students Director here at Home Ground. I hope you all are keeping well and safe during this time as we continue with life. Something else that has been continuing is our youth ministry, and we've been doing youth online on our Instagram, homeground underscore reflex, where you can find awesome talks every Friday at 4 p.m. and live worship on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. We would love for you guys to join. We have a whole lot of other cool stuff going on. One of the cool things that, we've, that's, uh, that just started is we finally started our young women's ministry called Her Ground. And we are creating a community of strong, empowered, young Christian women. And if you're interested and you are a young woman, we would love for you to contact us and we'll get you in touch with the Her Ground leader. I have three important things to share with you guys. The one is we're having a combined life group event on the 26th of August of prayer, praise and celebration. And we would love for you guys to join that. The second one is we're having our annual 133 meeting on the 2nd of September and it's a super important meeting and we would love all the members to please be there and even the rest of the church to be there. Uh, it's our first time doing it on Zoom and we really want to smash this and we really want it to be a success. So please join us for that. But the third one is we have Alpha on the 16th of September. It's a super awesome opportunity to introduce people to Jesus. If you want to facilitate or when you start thinking of people to invite, please pray into that because we would want to have as many people as possible at Alpha and it will all be online. Thanks guys. It all starts with an invite. Last year, 2.5 million people around the world tried Alpha. Each one with a different, unique story about how they got there. I was invited by a friend. The girl I work with. My brother. A guy on my football team. My hairdresser. My mum. My housemate. My barber. My mate from school. Personal journeys just like mine begin because people all around the globe invite their friends and family to try Alpha. It all starts with an invite. It all starts with an invite. It all starts with an invite. Who will you invite? So talk like this, it actually helps. If you if you go like this and you talk like that, that's, that might be useful. The reason that we're doing this is because we want to celebrate the three of you. Um, this is a, normally, in normal church times, we would be bringing you up onto the stage and, and saying well, thank you and well done uh, for your years of service. So for you, Jacques, it's five years. And Sean, also five. And Cindy, 15 years. Uh, I must admit, I can't believe that it's been five years. That transition between the corporate world and and the church world, I thought it was going to be tough. It wasn't that hard. Uh, I think it was because uh, I had uh, had the opportunity of being part of this church since about 2000, so I was very much already part of the family. But if I've got to, if I've got to highlight something, I've got to talk about our what we call it, and I must start off. We call our ministry moments. And that's a time on a Monday when we get together, ministry moments that each of our, our staff get to share a little bit about what's going on in, the, in their ministries and where God is working. And I must admit, every week I sit back and I, and I just listen to what's going on there. And my, uh, my, my heart absolutely just swells with joy, you know. Yeah, you're the sensible one, I think, amongst the staff. Um, <laughs> we, we often get a little bit um, carried away with ideas and thoughts and how we can do things. And uh, you bring a little bit of uh, grounding to a lot of us. Jacques? Yeah, it's just been an amazing journey. Um, I was speaking to someone the other day about some of my passions and um, some of my leadership, uh, um, uh, spiritual gifts. And the two things that I'm most, 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 most passionate about is reaching those who are far from Christ and leadership development and um, so obviously in my ministry I've been involved in youth for four out of the five years that I've been here and um, uh, just just reaching out to, to those who are far from Christ in terms of youth has just been amazing. The word passion is what came to mind of wanting to see the church being transformed of seeing people actively involved in church not just sitting back and being fed but serving and getting out there and telling people and actively participating in worship. Um, I think your heart, that's what you want to see is people finding their gifts, 
using their gifts and learning how to go further with that. Just for me, the highlights is the privilege of serving God and seeing people's lives change. There have been so many funny things that have happened in, in ministry. Um, you know, those times where you throw your name away by making someone feel welcome and you say, you know, I've never met you. And um, actually they say you have and you want to die. In terms of my husband walking up behind you, Moira, and, and snuggling up to you and thinking you're me. Yeah. Some fun. So that's what you can say when people say, um, no, we have met. You can say, no, that was Moira, not me. So yeah, you can thank get you. out of that thank one. You. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you, your passion, just seeing people's lives, individual lives transformed, um, you know, wanting people to grow closer to God, wanting to, people to daily spend time with God and pray, you know, that, that is just something that you want everybody to have access to and to know about. I'm going to pray for you. Father God, we just thank you um, for for the gift that the four of us have of serving you at, at Home Ground Church. We, we don't ever forget that it's a privilege and an honor to do that, so thank you, God. But I want to thank you specifically for these three people who are celebrating an anniversary year of, of being with us. And so we thank you for Jacques uh, for the last five years that he has um, served so faithfully. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given him that he knows you've given him and he's using in the right way. And we, we love that, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Sean, um, for bringing him um, into the church environment and um, yeah, just allowing him to understand that, that we have to do things in the right way, but we are a church. And at the end of the day, when we do things, uh, we, we strive to do it in the way that the Bible teaches us. So thank you, Lord, for Sean. And for Cindy, Lord, we thank you for her heart, uh, for the lost. Thank you for her heart for hurting people, Lord. Thank you that she's able to reach them at the place that they are at and, um, and through um, what she does at home ground lord and as as richard's wife the countless lives that she has touched along the way because of you and because of how you have equipped her to do um, what you've called her to do thank you father god for each of them in your precious name amen all righty god bless on great sean and Jacques. bye bye, bye. 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 Father, we just thank you for your love, your love for us, that would send your only Son. Thank you that you, Jesus, are our loving heart. That we can sing and celebrate of the goodness of our God. Because you loved us so much that you would give your only Son, that we could live in this hope, that we could live this life. So we honor and we just adore you, Jesus.
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Then came the morning that sealed the me 
farmer went out to sow some seeds, and as he was scattering his seed, some fell along the path. Very quickly, some hungry birds swooped down and ate it all up. Some of the seeds fell on rocky ground. They quickly started growing. But because they had no proper roots, as soon as the sun beat down, they withered and died. Some of the seed landed among the thorns. They started growing quite nicely, but the thorn bush choked the plant, and so it died. Oh, shame. But some of the seeds fell on good soil. Good soil. Good soil. It began to grow and grow. And grow. And grow. And at time, produced much fruit. Mmm. Mmm. So. The moral of the story. The moral of the story. The moral of the story is that the seed will produce fruit if it is planted in the right soil. So I was a youth pastor in the east of Johannesburg and um, we started off our youth group with 12 guys in the church and these oaks knew absolutely nothing about Jesus. They knew nothing about the Bible, nothing about worship, nothing about anything. 
So when I arrived there, I saw this group of 12 guys that met on a Wednesday night, and I said, guys, so what have you been doing um, all this time without having me here? What have you been doing during your youth group sessions? And they told me a whole bunch of interesting things. They had conversations about strange things, but they never ever spoke about the Bible. And I said to them, do you guys do worship? And they said, what's worship? It was a very interesting start of my ministry in the East Rand. But very quickly, um, it really felt like God was doing something incredible at our youth group. We, we rapidly grew from 12, 12 to hundreds, literally hundreds of young people showing up at our youth. And, and God was really doing incredible things. People were getting saved. They were coming to Jesus and their lives were being absolutely transformed. And for me as a pastor, it was incredible to experience. Um, but there was this one guy that, that felt like he was the devil himself. You all know that guy. I'm just going to call him Johnny. Um, this oak just frustrated me and my team every single week. Every single week. I would have my, my, my friend also volunteered at our youth. His name was Ray. He came to me every single week saying, Jacques, you won't believe what Johnny just did. Every week, Jacques, you won't believe what Johnny, Jacques, you won't believe what Johnny just did. And, and one night I was preaching. Um, it was an awesome night. And I kept hearing the most irritating noises coming from the audience. And I tried to scan my eyes across the room to see where this noise was coming from. But because there were so many teens, I couldn't pick up where it was coming from. Eventually, I see my friend Ray walk over to a group of people. And he found this guy. It was Johnny irritating everyone. Literally 350 people being distracted by this one guy. So Ray takes him out. I finish my message. I transition into worship. So everybody stands up and we're going to start singing God with, with our, uh, worshiping God with our singing. And I go find Ray, and Ray starts telling me what this guy's done. And, and I can't even remember all the things he did. I was just annoyed. So I, did, I lost it. I lost it. I, I didn't show Johnny that I lost it, but I, I was thinking I was going to ask this oak to never, ever come back to our youth again. I've never felt to this day, never felt that strongly about asking someone to not come back. Anyway, I say to him, dude, why, why, do, you keep, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep being annoying at youth? Why do you keep breaking the rules? Why did you feel it was necessary to talk constantly during my sermon? Why every single week are you tearing a 20 rand note in two when you throw it in the offering basket? Why do you do that? He says, no, I don't know. Then, no, no. Then he says to me, um, I wanted to share my money with my friend. I'm like, right, stop tearing money. It's just annoying. I go to him again and I say, dude, why is there clumps of toilet paper in the boys' bathroom against my mirror? Why did you do that? He says, no, it wasn't me. I look at his friend. I was like, dude, who did this? You told me it was Johnny. And Johnny said, no, actually, it was me. Why did you do it? I say, he says, no, I don't know. And I just said, dude, I asked Ray to go take a seat, go worship. I asked his friend to leave. And I spoke to this guy and I said, listen, I've had enough of you. <laughs> I said, do you like me coming to you every single week and shouting at you? Do you like it when Ray comes to you every single week and shouts at you? He says, no, I hate it. I said, so dude, why don't you just listen? I said, as much as you hate when we do it, we hate having to come to you every single week. And I just said to him, bro, why don't you, if you, if you come back next week, I want you to come back. I, I was lying. I didn't want him to come back. But I said, if you are coming back next week, why don't you try? It's an hour and a half, dude. An hour and a half, you come here. Why don't you just try and do what we tell you to do? The stuff we tell you to do, by the way, is straight from the Bible. The reason we don't want you to throw toilet paper against the mirror is because we want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, this doesn't belong to you. And when you do this, it frustrates the people who have invested money into this church. You're wasting our money. And he said, okay, I'll think about it. We're starting a brand new series today called The Moral of the Story. And Jesus spoke about, Jesus shared many parables. And we're gonna, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of these parables. And um, one of them, Jesus said that if you don't understand this parable, there's no way you're going to understand any of them. So essentially what he was saying is, if you're going to understand the parables, try maybe start with this one, try and understand it so that when you hear the rest of them, you can make sense of these parables. So it's called the parable of the sower. It's in Matthew 13. Actually, it's in all three of the synoptic gospels. But I'm going to read from, from, from Matthew 13. It says this, Matthew 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large, large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. 
And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then Jesus gives the explanation for this parable. In verse 18, he says, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away, this, snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sowed along the path. Now the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short while. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Verse 22 says, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So I'm going to highlight or extract three main ideas from this parable. And the first thing I want to highlight is actually in verse 19, where Jesus says the whole basis of this parable is essentially the message of the kingdom. He says we need to listen to the message of the kingdom. And, he, and what he is saying is we need to share and we need to preach this message of the kingdom. And the message of the kingdom brings people to salvation, but it's also about transformation. Jesus often spoke about the kingdom all the time. He would often say things, things like the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like. And then you would go on describing what the kingdom of heaven is like. The New Testament... The word kingdom is found 162 times. It's important for us to have a clear understanding of what the kingdom of God really is. I've discovered with myself that because I don't have any context about the kingdom, we are, I wasn't born in a kingdom, I was born in a democracy, and because of my understanding of what leadership or, or governance should look like, I don't really take some time to truly dig into what the word kingdom or the kingdom of God really means. Or... I would just brush over it, or I would potentially just think it means heaven. But Jesus wants us to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. So it's essential for us to have a clear picture of what this kingdom of God looks like. Now, firstly, the kingdom, any kingdom, is firstly about a king. So when Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God, he's saying we've got to know the king. We've got to introduce people to the king. And when he says we've got to preach the message of the kingdom, he's saying we need to preach the message about the king, who he's referring to himself. Now, this king is not a normal king. This king is the king above all kings. He is the lord of all lords. He's a just and good king who loves his citizens so much that he's willing to die for them. Speaking about himself, Jesus is willing to die for every single one of us. So this king loves the kingdom and he loves the citizens who live in that kingdom. His desire is that his kingdom would fill the earth. As this kingdom expands, he wants more citizens to become part of this kingdom. And he wants the people who live in the kingdom to live an abundant life. The life that, he, that they would experience by surrendering completely to the lordship of the king and living according to his rule and reign. Now, any kingdom has a constitution. It has laws. It has a code of ethics. It has an economy. It has an army. It has an education system. So does the kingdom of God. The kingdom is infected by the king's thinking. That list I just gave you. The constitution 
is infected by the king's thinking. The economy is infected by the king's thinking. So Jesus is saying, I need you to have an understanding of the inner workings of the kingdom. And the citizens should reflect the nature and the character and the culture of the king. Now, Dr. Miles Monroe gives a definition of kingdom. And I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it slowly because he says so many great things in this definition. He says this. He says, a kingdom is the governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, and his intent, producing a citizenry of people who express his culture and reflect his nature. Isn't that a beautiful definition of a kingdom? So Jesus is saying, this parable is about preaching the message of the kingdom, and once people receive this message, they receive salvation, they become one of the citizens of this kingdom. But then we get to experience all the benefits and all the blessings of this kingdom. And we are citizens within this kingdom, and we should live accordingly. We should be bearing the nature and the character of the king. Number two, spoke about the kingdom. First thing I wanted to highlight, number two, I want to speak about the seed for a little bit. So the seed Jesus is speaking about is the word of God. And what he is saying is, the seed will produce fruit. It has to produce fruit. In 1904, there was a man named Evan Roberts. He was a coal miner, and he was also a Sunday school teacher at his church. This guy decided he wanted to go into full-time ministry, so he joined a Bible college, and while he was there, he just became obsessed with the church and how ineffective, ineffective and how powerless he thought the church was at that stage. He was just frustrated that the church wasn't able to bring transformation in his community. So Evan Roberts lived in Wales. And what happened in 1904 was the great Welsh revival broke out. Because of Evan Roberts, this oak spent a lot of time praying, and he was sort of the revivalist of the time. And what happened when this revival broke out was that churches all over Wales started filling up. It had a significant social Im impact. They say that drunkenness was cut in half, which is awesome. And all the, all the, um, the laws that are broken because of drunkenness was cut in half. Crime was cut in half. They say there were several bankruptcies, unfortunately, during this revival. They said that many of the taverns had to close their doors because they just couldn't sell the alcohol. Men were spending time with their family and their wives. They weren't going out as much. Judges were presented with white gloves. There were just no cases to try. They say that mines production slowed down, the mines. Production slowed down. It didn't stop. It just slowed down because so many miners became Christian and joined this, became citizens of the kingdom and changed the way they spoke. They stopped swearing so much. And they say that the horses no longer understood their commands. So production slowed down. This revival took place when people started sharing the message of the kingdom. And this message of the kingdom produced fruit, so much fruit that 100,000 people came to Jesus in just five months when this revival broke out. 100,000 people in just five months. The kingdom seeds that were being sown were producing fruit. God wants his kingdom to be established and he wants the word, that's the seed, to bear and produce fruit. I just came out of, um, a few weeks ago, I just finished discipleship training with J-Life. And one of the facilitators shared a story about a young man that he discipled. He, he met him in 2010. And um, this young man came from Zimbabwe and joined um, uh, the this, uh, this school where they were teaching people how to do effective discipleship. And um, his name was Munya. So Munya finished his course. He went back to Zimbabwe and he started discipling people. Um, he started reaching out to his community, and um, within a short time, I think it was three to four years or so, he had established over a thousand small groups, okay? 
So you would find a group of people, you would speak to them about the needs of the community, you would say to them, follow me, and then they would join a Bible study, then you would disciple them and teach them all these principles of the kingdom, and then you would say, cool, now you guys go and start groups. In just three or four years, he established 1,000 groups. He stopped counting, he said it was just getting too difficult to track. And then one day, um, the, uh, the chief officer, chief, poli- chief policeman called him in. And he said to him, who are you? And he said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm Munya. And um, when he found out that they were looking for him, he, he was quite nervous. He thought that maybe he'd done something wrong and that he was in trouble. And, he, and the police officer asked him again, he said, who are you? And he said, I've already told you, I'm Munya. And he told him his whole name and his whole surname. And he said, no, no, I'm not asking you what your name is. I'm asking, who are you? Because you are, who are you to affect so much change in your community? He says, did you know that since you started your small groups, your small discipleship groups, the, the crime rate in your community has gone down with 80%. And Munya was just blown away, was just absolutely blown away by what was happening because the kingdom of God being established. And he said to him, before I go, he said to the policeman, before I go, can I just share something with you? And he started a little Bible study with this guy. And he said, um, thank you, did you enjoy that? And the police officer said, yes, I absolutely loved that. And he said, well, can I come back and do it again? And then the police officer said, yes, you can come, that and come back and do that again, but I want you to do it for all of the police officers in this area. What a powerful, powerful testimony of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom of God being preached and bearing fruit. Can you imagine what your community would look like if it had a a crime rate go down by 80%. What are we waiting for? Why are we not preaching the message of the kingdom? Why are, we not peop- why are we not telling people about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, about Jesus the Christ who died for them on the cross? Why are we not sharing that message with them? And why are we not discipling them? If God's desire is for His kingdom to bring transformation, and we're seeing it happening all over the world, we need to take up the mantle, and we need to say, this is my responsibility, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to preach and sow the seed of the message of the kingdom. Listen to what Romans 8 verse 19 says. It says, the whole creation waits breathless in anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. The whole world, all of creation is waiting for us to step up to the plate and be kingdom citizens, to transform the world. We live in South Africa. In a heartbeat, all of us can list a bunch of things that we are unsatisfied with, that we're not happy with. But if the kingdom of God was being established here on earth, in our communities, in our friends' lives, in our families' lives, things will change because God's desire is that the seed will bear fruit. Point number three, we've spoken about the kingdom. We've spoken about the seed, which is the word of God that needs to be preached. And then lastly, I want to speak about the soil. The soil is referring to the heart of man. So Jesus lists four types of soil. And um, what what God is wanting us to see, what Jesus is wanting us to see, see through this parable, is that he wants the word of God to bear fruit, But if it is not bearing fruit, there's a problem. Listen to what God says in Isaiah 55 verse 11. It says, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. Some translations say the word of God will not return void. But it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent it. So God is saying, I've spoken and my word is true. And my word will do whatever I've told it to do, and it will accomplish what I've intended for it to accomplish. Now, whenever I heard that verse preached to me in the past, I was like, that is awesome. God is saying his word is true. All I need to do is just do what God says and listen to his word. I almost feel like you can't preach that verse without looking at the parable of the sower. Because God is saying, my word will produce fruit. Jesus is saying, it should produce fruit. But if the soil is incorrect, it will not produce produce fruit this message of the kingdom that jesus is referring to is for those who are far from christ but it is also for citizens of this kingdom it is for you and it is for me 
And as we study and look at the Word of God, sometimes it bears fruit and sometimes it doesn't. Let's look at the three soils real quick. The first soil we see that Jesus refers to is, is the road. It's, it's hard. And when this word goes out, the enemy comes and steals it away. We've got to be aware of the fact that the devil is lurking and trying to prevent us from experiencing the fullness of God's kingdom in our lives. We've got to be aware of that. If we know that the enemy comes to steal the seed from our hearts, we need to know how to address it. We need to understand our spiritual warfare works and we need to step up to the plate as believers and declare war according to God's word. Second soil that Jesus refers to is, is rocky soil. He says that the seed goes there and it jumps, it's, it's, it grows quickly, but then it dies soon because the sun scorches it. He says the reason for that is because the word gets preached to us or we study God's word and then because we're afraid of persecution or when trouble comes, we don't produce a harvest in that seed because we were afraid and ran away or turned away from God's word during this time. Now, persecution, if you're living in South Africa, doesn't look the same as it looks for many of our brothers and sisters around the world. We know that. Persecution for us, sometimes it's very, very mellow. It might be as simple as standing at a bra with a bunch of friends and hearing them rant about how bad South Africa is. When Scripture teaches us that the power of death in life is in our tongues. Now, the truth is what they're saying may be true, but we, as God's King, uh, God's children need to establish God's kingdom here on earth. So we need to be standing up at those events saying, well, this is what God's word says. The power of death and life is in our tongues. Why don't we change the way we speak? Because if we change the way we speak, we'll change the way we think, change the way we act. We could potentially even start preaching good news to the people who are causing these things that you are referring to. And maybe even we might see an 80% drop in crime rate. We might see less women and children abuse. But because of fear that they may, may laugh at me or say something that may hurt my feelings, we don't step up to the plate and we just keep quiet. The third soil that Jesus says prevents the seed from prospering or growing or flourishing or bearing fruit is seed that's sown among thorns. Then the seed grows and the thorns grow and then the thorns crush or smother or kill the seed that was sown. And then he says, that happens, or this refers to the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. The worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth, Jesus says, will kill the fruit-bearing power of the seed in our lives. Now, can I just quickly say this? Many wealthy people worry. Many poor people worry. It's got nothing to do with an economic bracket. Many wealthy people are not being deceived by, the, uh, by wealth or by the deceitfulness of, of money. Many poor people are not being deceived by the deceitfulness of money. And the opposite is also true. Many poor people are completely deceived and blinded by the deceitfulness of money. And we're so consumed by it because we don't have it. And the same is true for people who have money. So this has got absolutely nothing to do with your economic bracket in life. Nothing. All of us worry at some stage in our lives. And Jesus is saying that worry destroys the power of the seed in our lives. I remember when, um, when Jesus called me into full-time ministry. I knew without a doubt that I wanted to go into full-time ministry. I knew that to do that, I needed to study. I needed to go study theology. And um, what I did was I said, Lord, okay, cool, I'm going to do this. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to obey you. Um, I looked around at my circumstances and there was just no way that I was going to be able to afford to go study full time. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I was worried. I was worried about how I was going to move forward and do what God has called me to do. And then I discovered Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. So Jesus is teaching there a bunch of things, but in the, closer to the end of that passage from around verse 25... Jesus says, do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear. He says, pagans worry about these things. Christians should not be worrying about these things. Now, the, this is the word of Jesus. This is Jesus speaking to us. He's saying, do not worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear. Then he goes, on, he goes through a list. He says, look at the birds. They don't sow nor reap nor store up in bonds. 
but your heavenly Father feeds them. Then he says, look at the flowers. Look how beautiful they are. Not even Solomon was clothed as beautiful, beautifully as they are. Then he says, what you should be doing. He says, you should be seeking first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Once again, the word kingdom comes up. He says, first you need to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he says, all these things will be added unto you. All these things will be given to you. Your heavenly father knows that you need clothes and food and drink. And he will give it to you. But sometimes we seek the wrong way around. We seek first to find these things and then maybe consider the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now the question is, how do we seek the kingdom of God? And that's the challenge. Because we read these passages, we know we should be understanding how God's kingdom works, but we don't. We don't know how to seek God's kingdom. Well, firstly, I mention the kingdom is first about the king. So you need to find the king. If you're listening to this message and you don't know Jesus or you're not a Christian, God loves you, whether you want it or not. And he wants you to find the king and his name is Jesus. And he wants to reconnect you with the creator of the universe. The God who made you. Then what he wants us to do is understand. This is how you seek. First you find the king. And then you become a citizen of this kingdom. And then you try to understand how God's kingdom works. It doesn't work the same as this worldly kingdom we live in. It doesn't work the same. What do we do then? Remember that list I mentioned earlier on? I said a kingdom has a constitution. It has a law. It has a code of ethics. It has an economy. It has an army. It has an education system. Do you know what God's kingdom looks like in terms of God's constitution? Do you know what God's code of ethics looks like? Do you know how to do kingdom economy? Do you know how God's army works? Do you know what God's education system looks like? So Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of God. So seek the king and understand the principles of the kingdom of God. Maybe you understand how all of those things work. I would encourage you to start teaching people. Start discipling people so that they too will bear fruit in their lives. Maybe that whole list, you don't know how anything, any of those work in the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying is, study and find out how God's kingdom works. You can't cram, you can't cram um, farming. You know what I mean by cramming? When you, if, you, if you've studied for any exam, maybe in trick final exams, you study the night before, you cram, 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 you force all the information in. Maybe you pass the test. The day after that, you can't remember a thing. Now, you can't do that with farming. You can't do that with God's kingdom. You can't take the seeds from his word and plant it in your heart and then think it's going to produce something tomorrow. It's going to take time. And you've got to cultivate the soil. And you've got to plant the seeds and you've got to nurture it. We've got to look at God's word as the final authority in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. If you want to have fertile soil, you've got to see God's word as the final authority in your life. Final wisdom. I'm going to wrap this up. We're back in the East Rand of Johannesburg. I just asked Johnny to come back if he's going to surrender and submit to the way we do things here. If he's going to surrender and submit to the kingdom of God, essentially. He said he'll go home and think about it. And then the following week he came back. <laughs> I wasn't excited. I must be honest. He came back the following week. And we had hundreds of youth there again. And and uh, it was just an incredible, incredible evening. And, and we had broken up into small groups. It, it was, it was in, we, we had grown rapidly, really quickly. So we didn't have enough leaders. So, so we split the groups into age groups. And, and some groups had like 30 or 40 people in the group. That meant I needed to divide the 20 or so leaders that I had in the, between the 300 and something young people. And, and some of them had two leaders. So, so there's this one large group that had about 40 people in, and I sent two of my leaders to go and minister and do whatever we were doing in the context of the small group, <clears throat> and, uh, and then I just walk around. I look at all these guys, look at a bunch of groups doing really well. Some groups were, were not doing that great, but I see this big group just thriving. It was amazing. I, I looked at them from a distance, and they were laughing, then they would keep quiet as they listened to the leaders speak, 
and then they would engage and nod their heads in. And I thought it was absolutely amazing. So I walk over to this group, trying to see who these leaders are, couldn't remember, and what they were doing. How are they controlling this large group of 40 young people in a small group? <laughs> I rock up at this group. I see my two leaders sitting on the floor, literally like kids, listening to the best story ever. And I'm like, what's happening? Why are my leaders not leading? Why are they being led? That was also my thought. And I was like, who is this guy or girl leading this group? And I look up, here's Johnny, this grade eight, controlling and leading this whole group. Absolutely thriving. He decided that he was going to find the king and he decided that he was going to be a citizen and not rebel against the kingdom of God, but submit himself completely to the authority of God's word. And he completely transformed, that completely transformed him. This oak thrived at our youth because he decided to follow Jesus. So what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that the seed will produce fruit if it is planted in the right soil. Let's pray. Lord, as we sit here today, we acknowledge you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We no longer want to be the kings of our lives because we're messing it up. We want you to rule and reign in our lives. And we choose to be citizens of your kingdom who obey you. We choose to study your word. We choose to sow your word in our hearts. Lord, and I pray that all the seed that we sow will land on fertile soil so that it will produce fruit so that our communities will change so that the world will change and be transformed because your kingdom is being established. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.